Denny Hamlin picked up his third win of the season on Sunday at Dover. Kevin Harvick will finally be in the five car. And was Dover a good race? All right, everybody, welcome back to Break Hard. My name is Matt, back from my weekend in Greensboro, back in the studio. Finally have the normal background behind me. It was a great weekend in Greensboro. I went down and did a couple of guest spots on the MAP-TV GAA Classic Car Auctions, talked some classic cars with Ryan Newman, Matt Yoakum. It was a nice learning experience. First day, a little rocky, never done live television before, never heard myself in my own ears, and then had to converse with other people. Saturday went a lot better in terms of what I thought when I looked at it on the video, but it was a fun time went to Bowman Gray Stadium as well we'll touch on that but first we need to talk about the NASCAR Cup Series race on Sunday at Dover which was a okay race I'm not gonna say it was a good race it was an okay race it was the Eric Almirola of races it happened you know it happened was it memorable no not really but it'll go down in the history books as being a race that Denny Hamlin won his third race win of the season ties him with William Byron for most wins this season both of those guys are on absolute heaters. Hendrick Motorsports, Joe Gibbs Racing continue to be the most dominant teams out there right now. It is Chevy versus Toyota, and it seems like it's going to be that way for a majority of the season because the Fords continue to be absolutely out to lunch. Noah Gragson finished sixth. That was the best finish for a Ford on Sunday, and their best finish was a result of, you know, taking advantage of some pit strategy there. So... They have a long way to go, which kind of made me think about it. Ford's had a rough start in basically all three series recently where they've introduced a new Mustang. And the Cup Series now, they are winless through the first 11 races. And the Australian Supercar Series, they introduced the Mustang uh, for their Gen 3 debut, and it absolutely tanked. So much so that they were complaining. They're like, we might have to pull out of supercars. And they also introduced their GT3 program, the Mustang program in GTD and the IMSA Series, and it has been lackluster to say the least. So... This might just be a Ford Mustang problem more than anything. But on Sunday, Denny Hamlin led 136 of the 400 laps, goes on to win the race, and the talk of the week will 100% be about mirror driving and air blocking. And this is something that's been around for a long time. Since the Gen 4 days, Jeff Gordon was accused of mirror driving, blocking air, taking away people's line. And I think that might be a difference in terms of like, what we're calling it back in the day they used to just be like oh he's going to take his line away meaning like if the driver's running the high lane the guy in front would then move up to the high lane take his line away and force that guy to try to find another way around him doing that did take his did was air blocking in a sense it's just become a lot more prevalent with the gen 7 car and kyle bush said that the best defense for this car or that the best offense is the defense for this car essentially meaning that this car is much better at blocking than it is at passing and then if you can get out front you can air block the car behind you and you know basically ensure that they won't be able to get around you as much as the booth tried to hype up the battle at the end of the race where kyle larson definitely had the faster car he caught the 11 of denny hamlin just couldn't find a way around him because denny was great at air blocking and after the race, Kyle Larson got out and said, hey, maybe we take the rear view cameras out of these cars because it seems like it makes it a little bit easier. Citing that he did the same thing at Las Vegas to Tyler Reddick and, you know, and watched him in this rear view camera. Rear view camera, not the rear view mirror. Rear view camera. And that's essentially how he was able to continually, you know, ward off any advances that, you know, Reddick was trying to make. And same with Denny on Sunday at Dover. And I'm not taking away anything from Denny Hamlin. I know there's a lot of fans that are not going to be happy that Denny Hamlin won. I mean, once again, a fan threw a saran wrap cucumber onto the track. Uh, second time this year that's happened to Denny Hamlin. So if that fan's traveling around to races and they just go to races that Denny Hamlin wins, if you don't want Denny to win, maybe don't go to the race. Seems to be a common trend here. At the end of the day, though, it was eh, in terms of race quality. You had seven different leaders lead over 30 laps. That's great. Corey LaJoy stayed out, ran long on strategy, led 33 laps by doing that. You had a number of other guys kind of come and go. William Byron had a really fast car. His car fell off the jack during a pit stop. That dropped him back into the hornet's nest. And then he gets caught up in a wreck a little bit later uh, when Zane Smith got into the 23 of Bubba Wallace, turned him back down the track, self-cleaning racetrack, collects William Byron. And then Chris Bell also got ran over uh, in, that, in that as well. Brad Kozlowski wrecked early on in the race, coming off a day where, or a weekend rather, where he said, you know, they was asked about another driver driving his car, and he's like, I've never seen somebody else sleep with my wife, but I assume it's probably the same thing. All right, probably could have come up with a different example for that, but sure, yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from a little bit. Uh, on Twitter, I did post this tweet, uh, a little aggressive, but confirmed. So, 
We had a number of incidents. John Hart Nemechek as well. D uh, Todd Gillen. I always call him David Gillen. Todd Gillen. And Ryan Priest caught on fire. Once again, NASCAR didn't list his DNF uh, reason for fire, which I thought was interesting. But the rocker panel catch on fire. Once again, the Fords have seemingly had this problem more than anybody. And they still felt like they had it figured out. Maybe they don't have it figured out. Priest was not happy about it. And I don't blame him there. One other thing we have to talk about from Sunday is the booth and the broadcast. Because there's one clip that is absolutely going viral, and it's of cameraman Mitch. And Mitch is Mitch is a guy that's out there looking for some ladies. Don't be a creep. But Mitch decided to zoom in on some ladies sitting up in the grandstand while Larry Mack was doing his live shot. And in the background, you can see the monitors. And there's Mitch zoomed in on this, this trio. Sup, ladies, is what Mitch was thinking. Ah, you can't do that. I was just in the production trailer this past weekend for the Mav broadcast of GA, like I talked about at the beginning, and it's cool to see all the, the cameras and everything, but I, you know, you know there was a producer or director yelling into the headset, being like, Mitch, get off of these ladies, like, zoom out, do anything, we're in the middle of a live shot right now. Mitch just wanted to see some ladies, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's everywhere uh, at this point, so not great. We also had Mike Joy say that Corey Heim was subbing for Eric Bell which is a new one for us. I've yet to see the racing reference page on Eric Bell, but I'm hoping to find one eventually. Not sure if he has any championship four uh, appearances. Not even sure if he has any race wins, but Eric Bell was being replaced by Corey Heim on Sunday. And then when you had the big wreck between Bubba Wallace, William Byron, and Christopher Bell, Mike Joy immediately goes, Alex Bowman's in it. Wasn't Alex Bowman. Clearly was not Alex Bowman. I was sitting at home. I was walking, actually, getting back. And I was looking at it on my phone. And I could be like, I was like, that's Christopher Bell. And then I saw somebody be like, well, you're being too critical of them. They're watching on tiny monitors at a racetrack. I'm watching it on an iPhone. This, this is what I was looking at it on. I could tell. And then they were like, William Byron turned the 23 of, of Bubba Walls. Okay. If he turned him, how the heck did he get front end damage then? And I'm sitting there yelling Zane Smith. And they're like, oh, William Byron caused this wreck. And it's like, oh my gosh. It's not that difficult, guys. And then they finally figured it out. Frustrating, super frustrating that they couldn't get that done. At the end of the day, this race was, in my book, probably around a 70. You could go 65 to 70. Some people might rate it a little bit higher. You did have passing. You had guys come from like 29th, like Chase Elliott, 29th into the top five, I, I believe, for, for Chase there. Yeah, 29th to fifth. Great runs like that. Kyle Larson, 21st to second. Cars could make passes. Unfortunately, getting you know, to the lead was difficult without having a lap down car essentially block the leader. There were on track green flag passes for the lead. They were aided generally by a lap down car, you know, helping set up that pass. And again, working through traffic is a major part of NASCAR Cup Series racing. I mean, Kyle Larson got stuck or not Kyle Larson, William Byron rather got stuck behind the 99 of Daniel Suarez, couldn't get around him. And Martin Truex Jr. was able to pass him and, and go on um, to take the lead. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. This race was fine. Like I said, it probably needed more tire fall off. The corner speed at Dover is still entirely too high, uh, but at least we had natural cautions on Sunday. The cars are seemingly a bit harder to drive than maybe they were. It all just comes down to arrow. Once again, it's unfortunate, but I don't know how you're going to fix it with this car and the cars in general. Chris Gabehart spoke after the race, and he wants crew chief, and he was like, honestly, if guys knew how to aero block as aggressively as they are now, 10 years ago, we'd have been talking about this a decade ago at this point. And he's probably not wrong. They were doing it, but not to the extent that they're doing it now, essentially. So it's been around forever. It's going to be the talking point of the weekend. We also had another talking point, probably, that will be discussed this week, is Alex Bowman's blow-up with his spotter, Kevin Hamlin. And they seem to be good buddies. Uh, off track, they seem to hang out. But coming off of pit road, Alex Bowman had a really good run going. He was running P2 at one point on speed, ends up finishing P8. Another top 10 finish for him. Four top five, six top 10s for him this season. As people continue, they're like, Alex Bowman needs to be replaced. He's the worst driver over at Hendrick. It, he's... Okay, the worst driver ever at Hendrick is still a guy that's continually putting in fantastic runs. He'll win a race eventually. Uh, so just perplexing how dumb people can be at times. 
But Bowman, coming off of pit road, is Kyle Larson's on the outside against the wall. Bowman's in the center lane. The 11 car comes out of his pit box, and Denny Hamlin basically creates an Alex Bowman sandwich. Bowman backs off. Sarcastically, comes over the radio and has, basically says, thanks for that, five. And his spotter comes back and says, this is a race. He's not going to just pull over for you. And then they go back and forth, and his spotter's talking to the crew chief, and he's like, oh, he just wants to wants them to pull over for him and win the F, like let him win the effing race. And then he tells Bowman to calm down. Uh, to you know, try to settle him down, and Alex comes back with just shut up and let me drive the effing car. So they went back and forth, and it wasn't like a haha type of jab thing. It was more of like I'm fucking tired of you right now, and I don't want to hear it anymore. So yeah, that's going to be something that gets talked about. I don't think Kevin Hamlin's going to get replaced as much as people you know on the internet will freak out about it, and I'm sure the guys over at DBC will give him a what an idiot award because drivers can't survive without spotters out there. Which brings up a Landon Castle tweet where he said that essentially he'd be in favor of getting rid of the rearview camera and also limiting how much spotters can say, you know, basically just down to only allowing spotters to say safety things like, oh, there's a wreck in turn four, watch out for this, you know, over in turn one, that type of thing. To which I tweeted out, I can't wait for Bert and Fred Ward to get all slobber mouthed about this on DBC. And man, it's like fishing in a barrel with those two dummies. They went right out there and tweeted just exactly how we expected them to. Listen, spotters are definitely important. Don't get me wrong. You need spotters up there for safety reasons. But could drivers do this without spotters? Yeah, absolutely. Formula One, IndyCar, dirt racing, they all do it without spotters. You could argue that there's a safety aspect to it, and there is. I'm not going to dispute that. But when these spotters get out here and act self-righteous, like they're the reason why these drivers are as good as they are, uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. I agree that they do have an important role in safety in the sport. I'm not going to deny that. But when they come out here and they're like, my guy won because of me. Outside of a super speedway, eh, let your guy go out there and drive. I think that's what most of us, that's kind of the genesis of what Landon was trying to say. We don't necessarily need the driver coaching. We don't need the SMT data being relayed from the spotter. Just let these guys go out there and race because in theory, it should create a better product than what we have. So that's probably where Landon was going. Of course, the brain trust over at DBC couldn't figure that out. Also announced on Sunday is that Kevin Harvick will finally be confirmed in the five car at Hendrick Motorsports. I mean, it's only taken the better part of a decade. Basically a decade ago, Kevin Harvick, of course, was in negotiations to go to either Stuart Haas Racing or somewhere else, and the five car at Hendrick Motorsports was potentially a landing spot. Well, this guy, Tom Bowles, who I believe used to write for Front Stretch, uh, maybe he does own Front Stretch at this point, I have no idea. But at the time, he tweeted out that Kevin Harvick confirmed going to the five car, and it didn't happen. It was never going to happen, in fact. But this guy ran with it, which I know everybody always, you know, kind of on the internet jokes now that Harvick to the five, like confirmed. Well, it is actually confirmed now because Kevin Harvick will be doing the practice and qualifying sessions for Kyle Larson as he is off at Indianapolis practicing and qualifying for the Indianapolis 500. Harvick will also be on standby for the heat races as well as the NASCAR Cup Series All-Star Race on Saturday night and then Sunday night for the All-Star Race in case Kyle Larson cannot make it back in time due to, you know, commitments at Indianapolis. Thankfully, this is just an exhibition race for NASCAR or yeah, for NASCAR. So he can likely miss it if he wants. But Kevin Harvick in the five car will at least turn laps at North Wilkesboro in that car, which would be really interesting. Hopefully he can provide feedback to the booth uh, as well. Cool of Kevin Harvick uh, and Fox to allow him to do this as well. And, you know, cool for Harvick to be able to get a feel. He went from Stuart Haas Racing. Now he can see what the Hendrick cars are kind of like. Basically, you know, only a couple, you know, a dozen races, dozen and a half races removed from um, being in that car. So let me know what you thought about the race in the comments. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.